Hi, I'm Nancy Bame. I'm a senior principal researcher at Microsoft Research in New England, and I'm here with Jean Burgess from Queensland University of Technology, and we're going to present some work from a book we've recently published called Twitter, A Biography. Uh, one of the great things about Microsoft Research in New England is that we have a really generous visitors program where we're able to collaborate with faculty who come to us from all around the world and spend some time. And what we're showing you today is an outgrowth of that work. Jean, you want to say a bit about who you are? Yeah, hi, I'm I'm Jean Burgess. I'm a professor of digital media at QUT, where I lead the Digital Media Research Centre. And like Nancy said, uh, it was a real privilege to be part of the uh, Microsoft Research uh, Visiting Researchers Program when, back when we started this project, which we're going to tell you all about today. All right. So. As you all know, social media matter. Uh, you can look at the headlines uh, any day, and it's there. I pulled these from the internet just the other day. Facebook worker quits and discuss. YouTubers draw maskless cloud. Twitter adds context to trending topics. So all around us, we see that social media are making the news, even as, even as they're really trivialized. They are a key component of our personal life, of our public life, of our political life. Platforms have, have, have a tremendous amount of power. They, they shape the communication available to us. They shape what's able to happen in different spaces. I like this image because it shows the original platform of the stage, in this case, in a concert hall. And if you think about it, you can look at this picture, and it's very obvious that this is a space that's been physically designed and built by, by architects in order to create particular kinds of social relations, particular kinds of interactions, particular categories of people. Uh, and the same is true when we think about social media platforms. On the one hand, it seems like we all know a platform when we see it, right? We know Facebook, we know YouTube, TikTok. These things are all uh, visible. We can look at them and say, oh yeah, that's a social media platform. But at the same time, Conceptually, theoretically, they're really quite slippery for a number of reasons. One is that they're constantly changing. So if the interface today doesn't necessarily look like the interface earlier. So this raises a lot of questions about how are we going to theorize? How are we going to analyze? How are we going to compare these platforms when they're continuously transforming? Um, and we need to be able to do this if we're going to understand it. So conveniently enough, Jean and I have written a book on this topic, um, Twitter, a biography. So what we want to do today is spend a little time with you walking you through the basic model that we've come up with in order to create uh, ways to do these coherent, rigorous, systematic analyses of platforms that can allow us to compare them to one another as well as to track them over time. And I'm going to hand it over to Jean for a bit now. Yes, thanks, Nancy. So our our case study, obviously, for for this book, this application of the platform biography is Twitter. Uh, but just to to remind us what it looked like when it started uh, back in in the mid 2000s, when Web two was the buzzword of the day, and we didn't like to include vowels in the name of social media companies. <laughs> that this is uh, the one of the very first kind of uh, company pieces of comp company communication about this new service that was formally launched in July 2006. Uh, a new mobile service that helps groups of friends bounce random thoughts around with SMS. Uh, it was actually a side project within the podcasting company Odeo, um, used short message service or SMS protocols to post what were called status updates to the web for the benefit of your, your friends and your followers. So. Uh, even within the company, however, it was, you know, really not sh certain what this was really for. Was it for sharing news or information with people? Was it for just maintaining social networks through what is commonly called phatic communication? So um, even at the beginning, there's a lot of uncertainty and ambiguity around this. This is what the original homepage looked like. So you can see that the, the way that we're uh, invited as users to think about this new platform, this new service is very kind of jokey, very informal, very um, interpersonal and social rather than uh, very serious, important or, or newsy. And the, the use of uh, cool internet slang like what up uh, is a pretty big feature as well. These are the some of the early tweets from the, the, the founders and early employees of the company. So um, actually, no real idea about what it's for, just kind of joking around. This is actually pre the formal launch as well. So this is one of the first employees saying this thing sucks. 
Uh, now, company CEO Jack Dorsey, one word status update, literally answering the question, what are you doing with uh, probably the only word that came to him in that state. Nancy and I, uh, like many people who studied the internet and or were just interested in, in social media, started our own accounts in around the same time, actually, uh, March 2007, when the buzz had started to kind of circulate around what was then called the blogosphere. As you can see there from this screenshot from Nancy's archive, which uh, were these archives were made available to users in, in early 2013. So uh, Nancy is literally answering the question that was posed to all users, what are you doing? Um, very literally, signing up for Twitter, even though I don't think it want it, I want it. Uh, Nancy doesn't tweet again until much later, 2000, in 2007, when, with characteristic comic timing, I have to say, she says, wondering why anyone is following me when I never Twitter. Uh, my first tweets are... There's a lot more of them, but similarly, very uh, mundane, everyday, taking literally the idea that you simply share what you're up to with your friends. Today, users are uh, invited to participate with the question, what's happening? So going from a really me-centered to a, uh, a world-centered kind of idea about the platform and the communication can ha that can happen on it. Of course, as we all know, Twitter is a major uh, mediator of news events from uh, natural disasters and crises to global pandemics and politics. It also remains uh, a really vibrant and active site for everyday popular culture. So K-pop Twitter is a global force to be reckoned with. It's grounded in fandom and, and pop culture rather than uh, big serious news and politics actors. And so this kind of journey from a totally mundane, some would say trivial and almost useless technology at the fringes of a little podcasting startup to this kind of global uh, news environment with all of the social problems that are very well known to be associated with it. We're really interested in kind of understanding how, did this, how does this actually happen? How do you actually get from there to here? And so this is where the platform biography approach telling this life story of the platform comes in. So I'm going to hand back to you, Nancy. So what we're trying to do with this approach, the platform biography, is not just to tell a story of Twitter, although it emerged through our efforts to tell that story of Twitter. What we're trying to do is to create a model that can be used to analyze any social media platform. So what we're arguing is that when you look at this trajectory of Twitter, and we'll talk a little bit more about it, that Gene, well, quite a bit more about it, that Gene has just laid out, we're arguing that you need to think about a number of different forces that come into play with one another and intersect and bounce off one another and, and, and uh, sometimes antagonize one another. So one set of things is around the technology and the design. And I think this is what people often think of when they think about a platform. They think, what do you see when you go to the site and you load it or when you open the app? So this would include the front stage things like the interface and the features of it. Also, the backstage things, the software, the algorithms, the APIs that allow that platform to engage with other platforms around the Internet, and the ecosystems of devices and services that come together uh, to make that platform work. But there's also the cultures of use that happen through these sites, the K-pops versus the news people. Uh, there's the communicative and expressive content of what people are sharing, the tweets themselves or the Facebook updates or the Instagram photos or pick your platform, whatever kinds of content people are sharing there. There's the practices and the understandings of the users themselves. And there's also a lot of public discourse about platforms. So example, one thing that happened with Twitter, uh, there was a moment of some years ago where a study was done that revealed that most tweets were, quote, pointless babble. And this got circulated all over the news and was very integral to Twitter's effort to sort of rehabilitate themselves as a serious site, not pointless babble. Uh, so public discourse is really, really influential. And then, of course, the business models have to be taken into account. What are the incentives that these companies have? Uh, and what do they think they're doing when they make the kinds of changes that they do? We demonstrate this approach in the book by collecting a variety of materials. And one could think about collecting a similar sort of materials for any kind of platform. So there's a lot of secondary literature about Twitter. There's books about Twitter. There's uh, articles, there's all of that kind of things. Uh, we 
did this oral history trace scroll back sort of interviews with archives as prompts. So Jean mentioned that uh, Twitter made it possible to download your archive. And one consequence of GDPR is that most platforms will now your, make your archive available to you if you request it. Uh, so we asked people to go back through their archives prior to being interviewed and mark places where they thought that their the way that they tweeted had changed. And so then when they came into the lab with us, we sat down and we projected their timeline, their archive on a big screen, and they just walked us through the points where they felt it had changed. And we talked about what, what had happened there. Uh, we combined this with the Wayback Machine, which allowed us to look at what did Twitter actually look like at that time. Um, we looked at media and tech press coverage. There were a lot of user blogs. One of the funny things about social media is that um, people really like to talk about their experience and they really like to write how to's and they like to explain to people exactly what they're doing wrong and how they should stop doing that thing. That was actually a piece of what sparked this whole project was our interest in the ways that users were continuously telling each other they were using Twitter wrong. Uh, and then Twitter itself, like many social media platforms, also blogs its own experience. And so there are corporate materials which are up now and that also are available through archives like the Wayback Machine. So we drew on all of these things together to try to speak to all of those areas that I just outlined before. Uh, one thing that became clear as we did this was that in any qualitative project, uh, you end up with a huge array of materials and you want to be able to, to shape it somehow, to focus it somehow. And I should say that the biography, the concept of biography was appealing in large part because just as with a human, when you write a biography of that person, you're never going to be in their brain, just like you're never going to be in the epicenter of whatever the real Twitter is fully understanding its inner working. So it's always gonna have in, inadequate access. And it's also always only, only gonna be partial. So the challenge is how do, you, how do you tell as much as you can? How do you get to the core of that story? How do you find a way in that really gives you a window into the big picture that's told through all of these materials, yet allows you to focus it, which is always a challenge in qualitative research. But in a, in a scheme like this, very much, very much the case. Um, and what we came up with by looking at those reports of when people said their behaviors had changed and looking at the coverage and when flurries of, of coverage happened was that a really key way to get at this was through specific features that are at the heart of the platform and that can really be used to tell that story. So in our case, we focused on these three features, the at reply, the hashtag, and the retweet, which I think anybody who, with a passing familiarity of Twitter has a hard time imagining Twitter without these features. In fact, one response uh, when we talk about this is sometimes, wait a minute, those weren't always there? Uh, it's, it's sort of shocking to people to realize that the at reply was not built from day one, but it wasn't. And what we found with all three of these features is that they, go, they went through a life cycle during a, a, a particularly uh, important moment in Twitter's history in the late audies from around 2006 to 2008 or so, where the users recognized the ambiguity of the platform, saw that there were all kinds of things they wanted to be able to do that they didn't know how to do with the platform, uh, or that it was just tricky to do because it was so, it was just an empty box, right? That was all there was, and you were very limited in how many characters. So they encountered these different kinds of problems, uh, like how do you say who you're talking to? How do you say what you're talking about? How do you say that somebody else said this already? Uh, and they, 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 and by they, I mean the users, the people using Twitter, uh, said, oh, we have a problem here. Uh, let's fix it. And they did that by appropriating these tools like the at reply, which had been used, of course, in email, but in, in other modes also and brought them in. Uh, Twitter sees this happening and it incorporates those features into their actual infrastructure. There's contestation about the way they've been incorporated, about how they're used. And there's a continuous iteration. And in fact, all three of these features are still undergoing contestation and iteration. 
throughout this process of contestation, iteration, appropriation, what we see, and Jean has alluded to this already, is this emerging tension between is Twitter a place for serious news where you need to be to find out what's happening in the world, which is how they now sort of position themselves, or is it a place for people to have this more effective, ephemeral social connection where they're continuously attuned to one another? And what we see happening over time is that the former bid for newsworthiness, for being important, becomes very important to the business models and to the public discourse in a way that continuously puts this use of it, of being more sociable, uh, hanging around, joking, going on uh, long tangents, watching TV together, those kinds of things uh, become less desirable and seen as do using Twitter wrong or at least a somewhat subversive alternative use of Twitter. Uh, next. What we see throughout all of this is that when Twitter incorporates each of these things into the platform, when it says, ooh, an at reply is a good thing to have, ooh, a retweet is a good thing to have, it does it in a way that allows it to be counted. So it creates metrics, and each tweet then starts coming packaged with metrics. How many times has it been retweeted? How many replies has it gotten? Uh, so you can imagine what happens, of course, right? People start writing tweets in order to get replies, in order to get retweeted. Um, and one of the things that we would argue is that people also start doing things like creating bots so that they can up those numbers. They start creating disinformation that has high likelihood of becoming retweeted. So you have this confluence of factors where a technology shifts from something uh, that is very youthful and free floating and doesn't really know what it wants to be that runs on a social logic of hanging out with friends and using cool internet slang that shifts into a media industry logic of presenting packaged material with nice metrics that can be sold to advertisers. Uh, so I'm going to turn it to Jean now to walk us through the three features a little more detailed. Yeah, I'm going to take a, a, a very rapid sort of journey through those early years that Nancy was talking about in each of these three features and uh, think a little bit about those phases of uh, early emergence and appropriation and embedding by the platform and contestation and how they've continued today. So the first of these, the first to be invented or deliberately created, I should say, by users is the at. So in the in the the book, the Twitter a biography book, we we talk about the at as as the key to Twitter's sociability, or perhaps a way of thinking about it is a is a way that the platform and its users modulate social connections for good and increasingly not so good. Originally, uh, the very first users of that uh, at symbol, which we're familiar with from email addresses was drawn from other platforms like uh, like Dodgeball, where the at is used to mark a location or an activity. So this idea of Twitter as being for a status update rather than for uh, social conversation is very much embedded in the uses of these, the, the, early, the three uh, early Twitter co-founders and employees. So uh, Dom's literally at an errand Ev's having a breakfast burrito at a place, herbivore, and Jack not using the symbol, but uh, at the, the actual word is at work. Uh, as Nancy was saying, the, the bloggers uh, in these early days were very active in talking about Twitter and how, how it all works, how it should work. And there's some debate about who used the at symbol to refer to another user first, but we think this might be the first one. Uh, so at with a space because there's no hardwired connection between somebody's username and a, a web link or anything like that at the stage. At buzz, you broke your thumb and you're still twittering. That's some serious devotion. Around the same time, so this is the end of 2006, a, a mere sort of five months after Twitter launches, some users start explicitly having conversations about should we invent some way to kind of really explicitly signal to other users that you're directing a comment at them or trying to get their attention 
and uh, Neil Crosby jokingly reminds Ben Darlow that this would the at symbol would be a good way to do this. Fast forward just a few months uh, to January 2007, and uh, sort of tech blogger Eric Meyer is is uh, in a very long post kind of expressing his dissatisfaction with how sociable and chatty and, and mundane Twitter has become, is uh, complaining about these kinds of practices like using the app feature to speak directly to other users, saying, uh, Twitter's becoming the most inefficient and unusable version of IRC, Internet Relay Chat, ever. Look, people, if you want to chat, get a chat room, you know? Uh, at the very same time, uh, and I think Nancy and I would both place ourselves in this camp, other people were, were becoming fascinated with the kinds of ambient intimacy, as uh, Lisa Reichelt called it, that social media was becoming associated with. So the ability to get to know other people um, either through directly conversing with them or just by letting the flow of their everyday experience uh, kind of flow past you as you're on social media. So this is a really active debate and it di directly centered upon the use of the at reply or at mention feature, feature where some people were really angry about being subjected to other people's social chit chat and other people were really valuing that. And as the use of the at feature becomes really embedded in Twitter, the Twitter community, the Twitter, the company or the technical platform has to figure out what to do about this. Should they hardwire it in so that we see everybody else's replies or should we somehow background it in the interface so that we don't have to see other people's social interactions? Well, fast forward again to the introduction of, of new Twitter, so-called, and um, this blog post from the official Twitter blog talks about how uh, a change that they had started to make to background replies to people you don't follow. So if I reply to Nancy and you don't follow Nancy, but you follow me, you don't have to see my conversation with Nancy. This created a huge uproar in the kind of early user community. And it speaks to this tension in the business model between trying to promote social networking and trying to create a clean, well-lit media business environment. Since then, the at feature has come to be used for far more than social conversation and connection. So we now have the ability to reply to yourself and for that to be uh, embedded in what's called a tweet thread. So for example, uh, this person here has, Anthony has used has aggregated a whole lot of responses to the question, things you wish your professor knew, and created almost like a mini essay using the thread. And of course, the reply function is also used for trolling and harassment and kind of flame wars on Twitter. If we look at patterns of different kinds of tweeting over time, this is covering that Twitter's sort of early to middle age period from 2006 through to uh, about 2016. We can see in the blue there are plain tweets, so tweets that don't mention other users, purple retweets, red replies, and green is mentioning other users, so saying at Nancy in the middle of a tweet rather than the beginning of it. And we can see that Twitter had a really strong period of kind of conversational growth between about 2009 and 2012. And since then, it's actually become less conversational, much more, I would say, broadcasty. You can see the growth of retweets, which we'll talk to in a moment. So uh, I think the overall narrative or the, the, uh, the life story of this character in Twitter's life is that the, the at reply or the at feature went from being uh, a tool for sort of sociable chatter to becoming um, something that is used for tweet storms and threads and, 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 and pylons. The hashtag is the second of our characters in, in Twitter's biography. Um, so we think about this one as having originally been invented as a way of kind of organizing or coordinating the Twitter conversation. That was the need that users were seeking to fill. But of course, hashtags have become something quite different today. Uh, one thing to really acknowledge here is that uh, 
despite the fact that Nancy and I have both been on Twitter since near the beginning, many of the existing historical materials uh, are still existing because they're written by people with a lot of access to an interest in uh, tech blogging and having their own websites and so on. So with that caveat, it, it still does seem that uh, the person who made the hashtag most popular or visible and promoted it most actively was Chris Messina, who's very happy to claim the title of inventor of the hashtag. I think a number of users were trying to find ways to do a similar thing, which is to do something about the huge amount of sheer amount of information, the sheer amount of material that was flowing through your Twitter feed, how could we organise ourselves a bit better? And if, if we wanted to organise ourselves, do we want to organise organize ourselves into, into groups of people or do we want to organise the conversation into channels or topics? And that's what this proposal for the use of the pound symbol uh, or hash symbol, as it's called in the UK and Australia, to organise topics or channels. And in this original post, uh, Messina goes into quite a lot of depth and thinking about how IRC channels work, for example, how other how other kind of social networking platforms organise things. Um, but the hashtag doesn't really take off properly until it finds its use case. And early on, that use case was for coordinating real time information about acute events like natural disasters and crises. And in this case, um, a, a bushfire or a brush fire in San Diego. Hashtags themselves started to proliferate, so uh, users needed to invent ways to organize the hashtags. And third party websites like hashtags.org were developed, this is about 2000, early 2008, um, in order to kind of aggregate the hashtags that were being used at that stage, mainly for events like, like crises or fast moving news events, but also for conferences, mainly tech conferences. And in fact, Twitter really takes off at South by Southwest that same year. But hashtags are actually even used as, as kind of meeting places or as organized events, as in the case of the um, ag chat hashtags, which have their versions in Australia and Canada and elsewhere, where early on they were used. So the farmers come in for the fields on a Wednesday night at 6 p.m., jump on the ag chat Oz hashtag and talk about um, life on the farm, uh, mental health issues, policy issues, um, and, and business practices and so on. Of course, hashtags are also used just as kind of exclamations, as jokes, and they're really, really, really overused by social media marketers quite a bit as this, as this um, meme kind of is getting at. But where I think hashtags have really found their place in kind of the popular imagination, the mainstream media is as the coordinators of, of issue publics and, and social movements. For example, there's a, an organization, a media organization in Australia called Indigenous X, which was founded both sim simultaneously, both as a, a hashtag, a community around that hashtag, and as a, a media franchise that seeks to um, amplify the voices of First Nations people in Australia. And most famously, um, Black Lives Matter, uh, as, a, as a hashtag, started to gather uh, momentum on Twitter in the wake of Trayvon Martin's shooting by George Zimmerman, uh, later became a social movement and then actually an organization um, by virtue of the hashtag's use in uh, street protests and so on. Similarly, uh, Me Too actually was uh, originally originally the name of a, an organization founded by Tarana Burke, uh, but Alyssa Milano uh, tweeted that hashtag as an opportunity to to share testimony um, on the, for for survivors of sexual violence and sexual harassment to share testimony, and from there it becomes uh, synonymous with a seismic shift in the way that sexual harassment is actually treated, number of high profile court cases and so on. Looking at the, the data again in, in the trends in tweets with no hashtags and tweets with hashtags, we can see uh, they have kind of steadily grown and become embedded in, in Twitter, but still a relatively minority practice. So I think the story of the hashtag is 
uh, from a way for users to organize themselves and their conversations into channels or groups to the kind of formation of ad hoc publics and in fact cultural war zones because of course those hashtags associated with social movements uh, attract vitriol, debate, contestation as much as they do support. Finally, the retweet. Um, originally developed as a way uh, to, to give credit to other users, to accurately quote their words, um, and to amplify the voices of others. This was uh, the clearest example in our, in our in our materials of a lot of different options being tried out by users. There was uh, HT for hat tip. So in other words, I heard this from Nancy. So H HT Nancy Bame, straight retweets via uh, spelling out the word retweet or even retweeting and later on the modified tweet so that you could uh, repost something somebody else said, but with alterations. This is, starts to emerge uh, quite late, quite a bit later in October 2008. Uh, you can see I wasn't too keen on the recent and rapid growth in retweeting. About five seconds later, I'm making jokes about retweeting by embedding retweets within retweets within retweets about tweets from people who wanted more retweets. So we can already see that there's a self-awareness here about how retweeting is about attention and log attention logics and, and metrics, as Nancy was talking about earlier. Um, Nancy's commenting on how the manual retweeting practices meant that tweets could change and um, and and be and morph and perhaps degraded meaning as they were spread around, perhaps as people trying to stay within the 140 character limit kept cutting off more and more of your tweet to fit in the retweet at retweet at retweet chain. So uh, as, as Biz Stone says in this official Twitter blog post, he says uh, that retweets were a great example of Twitter teaching us what it wants to be. So the, the company decides that it's really important to embed the retweet as an actual um, hardwired feature of the platform, but of course, in doing so, they close off some of those different options and norms around retweeting because the feature can only work one way. It has to work the same way for everyone and every client. And this gives us uh, the concept set sketch on the, this slide here um, is the concept sketch for what became known as the button retweet. So rather than typing retweet at Nancy Bame, I just now hit a button. Not only do I just hit a button, but uh, even if you don't follow, Na follow Nancy and I retweet some characteristically pithy and humorous thing that Nancy says, you're going to see Nancy's profile picture in your stream and underneath that it might say retweeted by Jean Burgess. So this seems like a minor technical detail, but it creates a, an enormous amount of angst and contestation in the community because they want to follow who they're following, they don't want if someone, someone, you know, perhaps a head of state that they don't want to follow uh, is retweeted into their stream, that feels like uh, a lack of respect for the boundaries and the Twitter experience that they want to, they have set up for themselves. Perhaps most significantly, though, uh, retweets become part of the metrics that Twitter feeds, even me, an ordinary user, to tell me which of my tweets are more successful in gaining more attention, in being spread more. So. Uh, and, and these days you've got a dashboard, just like any other media producer that tells you the trends, uh, which, of your, which of your content is, is gaining more engagement, impressions. So it's treating me like uh, a little mini media producer. So these are, this is the difference between the kind of media logics, as Nancy was saying, and the social logics that Twitter really started with. And the most uh, outstanding thing about this chart, I think, is the extent to which retweets are growing and growing and growing um, and plain tweets or just things I might want to say to the world are, are shrinking and shrinking and shrinking and conversation is being squeezed out by broadcasting and um, retweeting I would say. So I think the story of the retweet is uh, from a respectful nerdy citation practice to a metric and now just kind of a compulsive amplifier button that we just hit and hit and hit in our use of Twitter if we're not really mindful. So that was a very rapid fly through of the three 
features. I'm going to hand over to you, Nancy, to make sense of it all. So I think if we look across these these three features uh, with this approach of drawing together these different kinds of materials and thinking about the different forces that have been pushing back against one another and building on one another, you see these five primary things happening. You see real people encountering challenges with how platforms work and trying to figure out ways around them. And I can guarantee you that any platform under the sun, you can see this happening right this minute. Somebody is encountering some limits of the way the technology has been developed and is trying to figure out a way around it. And that's where a lot of innovation happens. So one really crucial piece of this is the importance of of user agency and of real people thinking through problems and problem solving and their role in shaping the platforms we take for granted. Uh, there's also stories of businesses seeking to grow, of Twitter saying, oh, maybe it's not going to be cool to be so casual and playful. Maybe we need some metrics. Maybe we need to pitch ourselves as news. Maybe we need to uh, make analytics on every tweet available and put that little box that you saw in that last vi uh, screen that Jean showed you showing people, you know, hey, if you want to promote it, here's how you do it, i.e. if you want to give us some money, we'll up your numbers even further, right? So you get this shift as the business tries to grow and become more serious, moving from that sort of more social impulse, more social motivation for the site and for its users to becoming a site for news and for self-promotion. And we haven't talked a lot about how uh, dependent upon Twitter journalists are, but that's a really important piece of this story also is that Twitter becomes the place where journalists hang out with one another and often turn to for their own information. Um, you have this movement we've talked about in a number of ways from these interpersonal logics to these media industry logics that are about capturing attention, capturing eyeballs, selling advertisements. Uh, and you also see a movement from third party innovation to centralized control. So the, uh, the fact that hashtags used to be supported by third parties and are now embedded entirely within the site um, is an example of this and we point to others. Uh, so these are the the phases one sees in the story of Twitter, this might not be the exact same story you would see in every single platform, and we would hope that it wouldn't be the same story you would see in every single platform. Facebook has its own very different qualities from Twitter, as do these other sites as well. Um, and there's many platforms we're not mentioning in these four little icons, uh, but you can imagine all kinds of all kinds of platforms. They do share... Um, these qualities that Twitter has, though, of they have features and they have stories that go across time. So if one wants to take this platform biography approach and apply it to looking at these other platforms, as we hope that people will do. And I might say also that although this is our platform biography of Twitter, it's one that spans a very particular time in its history, and it doesn't need to be the only one that's ever written. One could easily do one that covers a much more recent time period and pulls on different features like trending topics lists would be amazing. Um, uh, so if one is going to implement the platform biography approach uh, in any platform, this is how we suggest going about it. First is to identify a platform of interest, not too surprisingly. Second would be to find some examples of the evidence that would meet these basic principles on the right. Um, and the third would be then to identify some key features through which that platform story could be told. Uh, and these key principles, uh, these basic principles uh, that we want to stress and that I hope have come through as, as Jean and I have talked through the history of Twitter, is the way that the hardware and software devices and interfaces and protocols change over time, the way that users' experiences and practices change over time, the way that business strategies are changing over time, and the way that both media representations and self-representations of the platform also evolve over time. And with that, I think we're done. So we uh, have got some live Q&A following for those of you who are watching on time. Uh, and we've got some polls that I hope you guys take time to answer. And we're standing by ready to answer your questions. Jean? Thank you very much. All right. Thanks so much.
Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for sticking with us. Uh, I'm Nancy Bame, and I'm here with Jean Burgess. Uh, and we've been really enjoying your questions. You've been submitting during the during the thing and trying to get at them. We've got a few saved uh, that we thought uh, merited a little more lively discussion. Um, but we're still taking questions while we talk. Um, we might start with maybe one of those softballs uh, from Kylie about feeling sad or nostalgic for the old non-broadcasty Twitter, to which I got to say, oh my gosh, yes. And one of the things that we say in the book is Twitter used to be fun. And, you know, now it's, um, well, the term doom scrolling didn't come out of nowhere, did it? Uh, Jean, you want to say anything about that? Yeah, I to totally, totally agree. I mean... Um, I think one of the arguments that in in the book that maybe is implicit is that it's by no means inevitable that just because something scales up that it has to become this um, loud antagonistic kind of cultural war zone um, and and or even when it's not being a cultural war zone, a place for for um, attention seeking and um, and and broadcasting logics that the interpersonal and sociable nature of the platform didn't have to go away. And I think um, sometimes it shines through even today, even amidst everything going on in the news right now. Yeah. Which might lead us Which to, kind of to Holly's, Holly's question. question. Where did that go? Uh, and Holly asked, did you notice a renewed embrace of the quotidian and mundane, the dreaded photos of one's meals from the early years of Twitter on Twitter in the early weeks and months of the pandemic? Or has that now mainly moved to other platforms or both, but is now overwhelmed by the more lauded news function? Uh, I love that question because one of the things that I kept thinking about at the start of the pandemic was that suddenly everybody was posting pictures of bread and they're still posting pictures of bread. Uh, so that quotidian, I think, not only came back, but it um, the fact that it had been there all along and had clung, uh, clung, clung to Twitter despite all the efforts to get rid of it um, set us up to slip fairly easily mm -hmm. into sustaining ties in a period of isolation. Yeah, we we use we still use and instinctively reach for these platforms, even Twitter, to to reach each other, to connect with each other on the basis of our shared everyday experience. And so those moments not only gave me a little more hope for humanity, but you know, well, not only a little more hope for Twitter, but a little more hope for humanity, I think I should say. <laughs> What else um, do we have here, Nancy? We've well, there lot. are some people who are asking about do you foresee problems with Zoom or I want to be looking at multiple platforms. Mm -hmm. um, do you have thoughts on, on questions about applying this to other platforms in general? Well, I think we, we um, touched on this a little bit at the end of the, the presentation, but be, because every platform is... Um, particular, comes at a different time in history, um, maybe has different levels of, different degrees of openness to scrutiny. You have to kind of problem solve for each one. But um, I mean, it's a shame we can't just sit down and have a great chat with you all because I'd love to hear your thoughts actually on mm -hmm. um, which of these principles you think can be generalized and which can't. But certainly we think, um, and, and in workshops where we've taught this stuff, we found that trying to home in on particular distinctive features that, you know, that make, that provide the Twitterness of Twitter, the YouTubeness of YouTube or, or um, the TikTokness of TikTok, whatever it might be, is a useful thing to think with. So thinking about what is the distinctive um, feature or affordance or practice with each of these platforms and then to kind of do a thought experiment where you think, well, where would I find materials? Where would I, where would I find an archive that might tell me about um, this feature? Whether it's just it being talked about, whether those traces are found to be found on the platform itself, um, or or some other place. So, um, yeah, I mean, like I said, I'd love to hear from you what you think the zoomness of Zoom might be. 
in that sense. Or what else did we have in the chat? Uh, we had Discord. It's another good one, I think. And yeah, to answer the question about Discord, yeah, somebody should study it. I think that would be really good. Yeah, maybe you definitely. Um, but I would also add questions. that I would, I would hope that I would kind of hope Go that on. part of what the platform biography offers is a bit of a way to compare platforms as well, mm. um, and so that. Uh, we're not just doing each one in isolation. Part of what makes Twitter Twitter is that it's not Facebook and it's not Instagram and it's it's not WhatsApp and it's not a text message and it's not a phone call. So the ecosystem within which any of these platforms exist is a really important component of what makes them what they are. So, for example, when Twitter uh, started explicitly saying we're not a social network, we're an information network, they were choosing quite strategically to distinguish themselves from Facebook. Uh, um, there's a question. Did you want to say something about that, Jean? No, no. Okay. I'm just looking at um, Ashwin's question here about... And Emily's uh, as well. We were dependent. And Emily's, if we, could, if we could talk to the people. There's a number of questions that sort of get at, what if we could get to the algorithms? What if we could get to the people who run it? What if we had a perfect view of, of all aspects of this? What story would we tell differently or, or how would that help? You want to you wanna respond to that? I have thoughts, but I'd love to hear yours too, Jean. I have a few thoughts. Um, one of them I'll is you too. That, that I feel like... Um, the company-centered story of platforms um, is probably more frequently told, and that tends to center the designers, engineers, uh, business models as um, almost the, the, the only actors or the, the determinants of what platforms become. And while, of course, obviously, um, they are super important, um, um, I'm really concerned in all of my work to think about the role of um, diverse user communities who don't always agree in in co-shaping or co in the co-evolution of these platforms. And so actually it's um, as important to get at the equally um, non-obvious experiences of users over time the change in the way that the platform's actually experienced, used, practiced. Um, that's just as important as trying to figure out what people were thinking behind the scenes. And secondly, in terms of, um, you know, quite rightly, a lot of people in our sort of fields at the moment are trying to understand what algorithms are doing. There's a sense that you could get inside the black box and figure out what they're doing. But uh, again, implicit argument in what we've done here is that you can find out a lot about what they're doing based on what they what effects they have on how the platform looks and works and is experienced by real people. Nancy, uh, I I want I I love those answers and I'm gonna I'm gonna let them stand because I think that the, this is a really important part. Uh, I really like this question that uh, Yupa has asked about why do we leave out the likes feature? Is it less significant? And the reason uh, that we don't talk about the likes feature is that we came to these three features because we we asked people to download their archives and go through them and find places where they felt like the way that they tweeted changed. And then we interviewed them about that. And it was through that process that those three things emerge from user experience as being really important. And likes somehow weren't, I think likes are crucially important, um, but they didn't stand out in the same way as part of what makes mm. Twitter Twitter, partly, I guess, because you can like on every platform, so it wasn't distinctive to, yes. to Twitter per se. Although it would be a nifty extension exercise for Somewhere yeah, it would be to, awesome to I'd look love at, to read a paper about to, to, the like button. Yeah, to add that on. And actually, um, while we were drafting the manuscript, there was that controversy about the star, the Twitter star, which used to be what you used to mark 
something that's my right. favorite. The book used to the draft used to open with the how people got so upset when the star turned into a heart. It, yeah, the exploding heart. Uh, and that was, yeah. and, and I mean, I think in terms of uh, applying this approach to other platforms, finding those little moments where there's contestation about a platform change, like a little controversy analysis, is a really nifty, neat way to get at um, how all of these different elements of the platform are intersecting and um, affecting what it means. Uh, Anna Hello is asking about how this compares to the walkthrough method developed by you and colleagues at QUT, Gene. You want to speak to that briefly? Maybe you could tell folks what the walkthrough method is because perhaps some people listening are not familiar with that. And it's another great strategy for looking at platforms. So the app walkthrough method is another um, set of tools to do the cultural analysis of apps or platforms. And I would say so that just involves um, really just slowing down the user experience and kind of obsessively documenting through lots and lots of screenshots exactly what an app looks like uh, as as you flow through it as a user and using that to try to figure out what questions to ask about how the app or platform works on the back end. And I would say that could be a useful tool as part of a platform biography. So if you really wanted to figure out um, what aspects of the interface were really worth um, doing a history of that that the walkthrough might be a really useful first step. I'm thinking about Deborah's question here about sampling participants, and I I, I just wanted to say that uh, we. Uh, we we sample participants based on convenience. We we don't have a, a claim to uh, any kind of random sample or anything like that. And and my hope would be, my assumption would be that if you were to speak with, uh, if you were to take different kinds of populations and do the same thing, you might find different features of Twitter. And again, this is where I think the biography metaphor is useful because. This is true of people as well. If you if you uh, tell the story of a person from one person's one population's point of view, you're going to get a very different story than if you tell it from somebody else's point of view. And that's it doesn't make one or the other story less true. They're both um, valid tales of what this platform meant in people's lives. Character limit. <laughs> There are a lot of questions here, so we're just reading through them, trying to figure out where we... Uh, do we want to talk about spam and, and bots and, and non-organic content? I, I, I guess what I would say about that, uh, this is in response to the question, what would you say is the impact of non-organic content, spam bots in the Twitter experience, and how has it evolved through Twitter's history or in recent times? Um, I think the impact has been uh, to pollute, to pollute and disrupt and, and damage damage the environment. Um, and I think that it's a result of incentives that uh, that we've talked about of this media logic that drives particular kinds of behaviors. Because the whole point of these bots is to trend, is to appropriate hashtags, is to uh, drive replies is to get retweeted is to is to flood to flood the system so I think it's it's a by and large I think it's a bad development that can be traced at least in part to the shift in logics that we have tried to outline here agree I think we have time for maybe one more and I think I'd like to answer Peter's Peter Quirk's question here Twitter different consumption okay. models. From, so um, uh, how many other platforms have multiple consumption models? I think this is a, a great one because the answer is these days, uh, not many. I think Twitter was, Twitter is an interesting case because it, it was kind of at the end of the open innovation web 2.0 um, ethos where you would build a, a bare bones platform, open up, uh, its various 
APIs to third-party developers and they would figure out what it was for and um, other applications. They'd invent all of the different user uh, clients, meaning the apps that you, you access Twitter through. But gradually, um, Twitter converged with the other platforms in going for a really seamless integrated user experience. So they basically bought up those third-party apps and then set up their rules to make it uh, impossible for developers to develop new ones. TweetDeck is kind of the last man standing, I guess, uh, because it's something that is really important for power users, but not all users. So um, it's just a great question to allow us to talk about that um, other bit of the platform's history in terms of its relationship to the rest of the social media ecosystem and, and technical ecosystem. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. we need to wrap it up. So I think we need to wrap up and say thank you all so much for attending. And we really appreciate we were, well, gosh, what if nobody asks questions? But ha ha, <laughs> you, you showed us and we love it. Um, we've got a resource section that should be somewhere on your screen or accessible to you. Uh, you can access the introduction to the book and some other uh, some other writings and things like that, some other sources. Um, so we're hoping that you guys all build on this and, and uh, we look forward to seeing some other platform biographies in the future about Discord and Zoom and all those other platforms out there. And last point I'll make is that yes, economists and media studies people use platform very differently. In one case, it's seen as a marketplace and in another, it's seen as a stage. So astute observation there. Thank you so much, everybody, and we'll see you on uh, Twitter. Thank you so much, everyone.